Welcome to M4C YouTube channel, Minicasha Community Christian Church. I'm Pastor Andy Morris, and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to continue looking at Jesus with eyes wide open, and today we're going to take a look at a story, a parable that Jesus shared that really focuses on the love of our Heavenly Father. Now in the story there's a, a dad with a couple of sons, but, but I really want us to focus and see the love of of the Father as we share our time together today. A few years back, the Antique Roadshow came to Boise. My mom and my wife were able to go and be a part of that experience, so they took a couple treasures to get appraised at the Antique Roadshow. Both of them were told, after standing in line for two to three hours, that the treasures they bought, brought were quite valuable to them. <laughs> besides sentimental value, there wasn't a whole lot of monetary value, but besides being tired from standing in those long lines, they had a great time. Antique Roadshow and to an extent reality TV shows like Pawn Stars and uh, American Pickers, they're popular because people like the intrigue and the mystery of finding value in stuff that many would overlook, assuming that they have, it has little to no value, or even just toss it out as worthless chunk. And, and I was wondering, why are these television shows, these reality shows, so popular? I came to a couple of conclusions. Number one, everybody loves a good treasure hunt. And if you don't believe me, get up some morning and, and, and go do the garage sale, yard sale thing, or go to an estate auction and just watch the people seeking for that one item, that one treasure they just have to have, or or maybe they can restore or repurpose. Usually it's more about the hunt than it is about the treasure that they find at the end of the hunt. For example, take a lottery ticket. We know the odds are highly against it, us, but just for a moment, before the drawing of the numbers is given or before we scratch that ticket off, people love the suspense, the possibility, the chance that they're gonna win the big bucks. Like Charlie in Willy Wonka, the little boy, the excitement of opening the candy bar to see if there was a possibility of a golden ticket, that was far better than the chocolate itself. But the second conclusion I came to is the appeal of these shows, it's good for the human psyche. It's good for us to realize that sometimes that which is unusual, maybe a little older or dated or misused or worn or faded or rusted, out of shape, no longer working like it's supposed to, or maybe even abandoned, we can still have value. It can still have value. And this is bigger than we think. The enemy of our souls, he doesn't have to completely deceive us about how awesome our God is. He doesn't have to feed us a lie that, oh, he's just awful. All he has to do is distract us, just to divert our attention from God and his plans and his purpose for us. And then, once he gets us distracted, he starts throwing in his simple, subtle whispers and lies. Consider the Garden of Eden, when all he did was cast doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve. You won't die. God just doesn't want you to be as wise as him. Just a whisper, a small wedge in your relationship with God, but it was enough. And he does the same thing with us, not huge, blaring, knock you off your seat, distraction, simple whispers. You're too old, you're too young, you're not good enough. Nobody likes you, nobody even cares about you. Or how can an all-knowing God care about you after what you've done or what you've said or what has been said or done to you? And as whispers go on and on and on until we believe him, or until we stop listening to him. Stop listening and focus only on the words of love, words of hope, words of grace and truth that our Heavenly Father is speaking to us constantly. The beauty of Christianity is we have a God who's the original treasure hunter, as well as being the author and creator of the greatest masterpieces of all creation. Friends, as, ma as impressive as the majesty of nature might be, the universe and all its glory, I'm still convinced that God's greatest treasure is mankind. To make it even more clear, God's greatest treasure is you and me. It's not the wonder of creation, the night skies, the ocean, the white-capped mountains, or any other created being. 
it's you and me. We're the ones that he breathed life into. We are the ones who were created in his image. And remember this, when God goes looking for treasure, he always finds. We might work really, really hard to make ourselves unrecognizable to him, but our Father is still able to see the treasure he created in each one of us. Jesus came to earth to show us exactly what God is like. And today, we're going to go to the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, where Jesus shares a few parables, stories with a message at a point to help teach his followers about God and his heart for his children. In Luke 15, Jesus shares three stories about people who'd lost something valuable and how they were able to find them again. He talks about a lost sheep and then a lost coin, and then he comes to the parable we're gonna look at this morning. Often it's called the parable of the prodigal son, but I believe as we look at this text this week and next week, we're gonna see that though the son is important, this really is the parable of the loving father. In this parable, Jesus is teaching us that the God of the universe is like the Father in this story. And the wonder and beauty of the character of God is easily seen in this parable. And we're going to see some important truths about the loving God that's going to inspire us beyond simple knowledge to life change because of that knowledge. So let's start in verse 11 of Luke 15. Jesus continued as he'd been speaking the other two parables. He continued, there's a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate, my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now this is not nearly as straightforward or simple as it might appear. This younger son demanded to receive his inheritance, although his father is still alive. According to Jewish law, a father who had two sons was to leave two thirds of the estate to the oldest son and one third to the younger. Traditionally, an estate would be divided into equal portions depending on how many sons, plus one. So the oldest son would get an additional portion. If a father had five sons, they would divide the estate into six portions, and the older son would get an extra portion. In this case, two-thirds to one-third. Now, that might not seem fair in our world, but in those days, understand the oldest son inherited not just an extra portion of the estate, he also inherited the responsibility to care for and provide for the lives that were impacted by the father's passing. Wives, employees, upkeep, etc. of the father's estate. This younger son, however, he was tired of waiting for his portion. So he had the nerve to actually express that to his father. I know it's a week early, but how's that for a happy Father's Day? Hey dad, you're worth more to me dead than you are alive and I'm tired of waiting. The arrogance, the selfishness, the lack of appreciation and love, they combine to make it pretty difficult for us to have much sympathy or concern for this son as the story continues. Obviously, the father was wounded by this harsh demand, and it seems very likely that he would try to explain, reason, or change the younger son's mind, but obviously with no success. Even though he did not have to, this father did what his son asked him. Logically, it would take some time to sell off some of the land or the livestock or liquidate other assets, but eventually he comes up with a third of his net worth and he hands it to his younger son. Now in the process, it's reasonable to assume that the older brother might have had some strong feelings toward this little brother, even though he too, as the oldest son, got his inheritance early. It may have been in IOUs and promissory notes, but Jesus states the father divided his property between them and immediately the youngest son takes the money and run now that's not what the scripture says actually in verse 13 it says this not long after that the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living i love how jesus uses six words in verse 13 to describe what happened he squandered his wealth in wild living a lot can be read into those words. With a pocket full of money, he headed straight for Vegas or something like that. Before he could turn around, it was all gone. There was no money. There were no friends. There was no home. There was no hope of things getting better. And it didn't as we read on. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This is a big deal. This young man ended up in a pig pen slopping hogs, which was as low as a Jewish man could possibly go. Pork was forbidden. It was an unclean food for the Jewish faithful. I'd venture to guess that we've all known people who at one time or another were committed to Jesus. They were active and involved in his church, but somehow, somewhere, they allowed the whispers of the enemy to create a wedge between them and their heavenly father, much like the man in our parable. Oh, it's just one time, it won't matter. Nobody will ever know. It's just a simple chat message or a simple flirtation or, you know, he or she just needed someone to listen to them or I want my share now, not later. Though it makes for good advertising, what happens in Vegas? It doesn't stay in Vegas. And before they know it, everything they knew and loved is gone. And too often people wonder, well, if it was so wrong, why didn't God stop me? For the same reason he didn't stop Adam and Eve from eating fruit. For the same reason he didn't stop King David when his eyes were attached to Bathsheba. For the same reason the father in our parable didn't fling himself across the door and say, stop it, son, I won't let you leave. That's not the nature of God. That's not the nature of our Heavenly Father. He loves us so much that He allows us to make our own choices, even though He knows what the consequence of those choices might do to our life. So as the Father grieved because His Son had walked out, so does God the Father grieve when His children walk outside of fellowship with Him. Continues on in verse 17, the young man, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. Friends, this was a big turning point. In verse 17, Jesus said, The son came to his senses and realized the servants at his father's home had it better than he did. All of his father's farmhands had three meals a day, and here he was, not even allowed to eat the corn cobs that the pigs were eating. Verse 18 continues, I will set out and go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. Here's the thing we need to see. He swallowed something more tasteless than corn cobs. He swallowed his pride and he started the journey back home. It's interesting, scholars have discovered a similar story to Jesus' parable that existed among the Jewish rabbis years before Jesus told this. In the earlier form, the youngest son ran away, spent all of his father's money, and when he came crawling home, the father rejected him. So as Jesus is telling this story, knowing that there's Pharisees and other Jewish leaders in the crowd, they're sitting there thinking, yeah, I've heard this story before. His audience was expecting him to say, one day the father saw his son returning. He waited with his arms crossed. The broken down son begged his father to take him back. In the original story, the father turned away from his son and told him he was getting what he deserved. And that was what the Pharisees were expecting the father in Jesus' story, how they expected him to treat the son. But Jesus gives it a surprise twist to the plot. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Rather than hoping one day for the opportunity to point his finger at his son and say, I told you so, this father was praying, watching every day for the return of his son. And when he saw him, he started running. Understand, culturally, a man in this father's position and his age They just didn't do that, especially when they'd been shown the incredible lack of respect, love, and honor that this man had exhibited from his youngest son, as well as the horrible horrible behavior that you know word had been getting back to the dad about how his son had been living wild and recklessly. 
The reaction of those listening to Jesus that day would not have been favorable, favorable toward a father who had compassion and then behaved like a child, gathering up his robe and running to this ungrateful, lacking honor son who was soiled, smelling, and hungry. This son who knew he'd be lucky to even get the chance to speak to his father. Never in his wildest imagination would he have thought that he'd be swallowed up in his father's arms, hugged and kissed as if he was the best thing his father had ever seen. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I, I can almost imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees at this point, they're confused. This isn't going the way we know it. But with these words thought, okay, now the father's gonna let him have it. But no, verse 22, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Now I know that the parable doesn't stop there. And next week we're gonna look at the second part of, of, this, of this parable. But for today I want us to recognize three very important truths from verses 11 to 24 as we look at the interaction of the father and the rebellious son. First thing I want us to see is that a rebellious child is still the father's child. Growing up, my wife and I often told our sons, you're responsible for your thoughts, your behaviors, and your life choices, not your mom and I. Now please know that we will always love you. We'll always be your mom and dad, but we may not always support your choices. We may not always enable your behaviors, but that doesn't change or remove our love for you. They got it, they understood. Well, we see something very similar in this morning's parable. The whole time that the prodigal son was away, he was still a son, but he'd left the presence and favor of his father. His father would not enable him, but he still loved him. So don't miss the point of this parable from a spiritual standpoint. The Father in this parable obviously represents our Heavenly Father, God. And friends, if you choose to rebel and ignore His, His principles for life that He's given us in His Word, He's not going to force Himself upon you. He'll hate your choice because He knows the price that was paid by Christ so that we could be his adopted children. And he knows the consequences of rebellion, of sin, in the lives of his children. But if you're bound and determined to do something as foolish as walk away from your relationship with your Heavenly Father, though it will break his heart, he's not going to stop you. He does not force obedience and loyalty from us. He wants us to freely love and serve him. That's important understand that a rebellious child is still the father's child. The second pr truth that we see in this text about our loving father is our father's arms are open wide. The father's heart was broken when his son left. Every day he prayed for his son. He wondered where he was, what he was doing. He'd walk to the edge of his property and then to the city gate scanning the horizon, the road as far as he could see, looking and longing and hoping that one day his son would come home. And then one day he sees a bent figure dragging along the road. It can't be his son. His son always had a spring in his step and held his head high. And besides, this character's dressed in rags. His son was always dressed in fine clothing. But as he continued to look, there was something about this figure that looked familiar. And, and suddenly this father realized that's my son. And not caring what anyone else thought, leaving all dignity and pride in the dust, this father ran this to his defeated, broken down, dirty, stinky son with his arms open wide. And friends, God, our heavenly father, he runs toward us with arms open wide to welcome his children in the same way, just as we are. We sang earlier in our service today about our heavenly father being a good, good father. I love that song. It repeats the line, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. And then it talks about us, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. Some of you have drifted out of fellowship with God. For some reason or another, you've walked away from the presence of your Heavenly Father. Maybe it's in rebellion, maybe it's in pride, maybe it's in arrogance, or maybe it's just you really don't care. 
You've listened to the whispers of the enemy. You don't need God. You're fine on your own. Or maybe live a little bit before you get serious and disciplined. A little fun never hurt anyone. Or a very popular one these days. There's no God. You only live once, so go for it. Or even worse, how could a loving God allow the bad things that are happening in this world to happen? Friends, if you think there's distance between you and God, if you feel like that, who moved? It wasn't him. We're the ones who walk away. But remember, he's a good, good father. And I am, you are loved by him. That's who we are. So when we remember this truth, or as the scripture told us, that the son in the story came to his senses, and we turn toward home, know this, our Father is waiting, He's watching, and He's going to come running with arms open wide. The third truth that we need to hear from this text is that our Father restores us when we repent or come to our senses. When He finally came to His senses in the parable, the Son rehearsed the speech He was going to give. He said three things in verse 21. First He said, I've sinned against heaven, and He was right. Primarily, all sin is against God, and so he confessed that he had sinned against God. Then secondly, he confessed to his father, I've sinned against you, and he's right again. One of the hardest things for any of us to say is, I was wrong, will you forgive me? But in the third statement, he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your child. Now, from his standpoint, that was true. And since he didn't think he would deserve to be a son, he was ready to ask, Father, just make me as one of your servants. His father refused to even entertain that idea. Instead, he commanded his servants, bring the best robe to cover up the filthy rags. He put it around his shoulders, covering the filth and the dirt of his mistakes. That's a picture of how God covers our sin with his righteousness. And then he goes on and he, he puts sandals on his son's feet and he, and he gets the ring, the family ring that identifies him as his son. Friends, what an incredible picture that is. We get to enjoy God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, our Father's grace. We don't deserve to be his son or his daughter. There's nothing we can do. It's a free gift that he gave us. And then the Father threw a party. He restored everything the son had lost or thrown away, and then the father throws a party, complete and total forgiveness. He treats his son as if he'd never left home at all. So I think we all need to ask ourselves a question this morning, today, whenever it is. Have you wandered away from God? Have you come to your senses and realized how much you walked away from when you left your father? Are you willing to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you? Are you willing to return to him? If you are, the Heavenly Father has a message for you. Come home. Come home. I'm waiting with open arms. I forgive you. I want you home so that we can forget about this little episode and we'll continue on our relationship just as if it never left. Do we deserve that kind of love from our Father? No. But that's what we get when we accept the Father's love. Would you pray with me? Father, that's a love that is so big, it's hard for our minds to wrap around it. Father, it's hard for us to live and love like that. Father, thank you for unconditional grace. It's not about us and what we've done. It's all about who you are and who we are because of you. We're loved by you. Lord, thank you. Thank you 
for the Father's love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, every week as a part of our service, we come to a time when we dedicate time in our service just to participate together as the body of Christ, those who have accepted that gift, that grace of God, the forgiveness of sin. And we remember when God came near through the, the actual person of Jesus, and we remember Jesus' ultimate gift of love, the sacrifice of his life, on the cross of Calvary. We come together every week as a part of our service to partake of these emblems, the bread that reminds us of the body of Christ and the grape juice that reminds us of his blood. We do that because in the early church, in the book of Acts, that's one of the things that the church did when they gathered together to worship. They shared these emblems to remember so they'd never forget the gift that was given them that made eternal life, unconditional love from the Father possible. This morning, if you've got some bread and some juice, we encourage you to partake, to eat and drink, to remember what Christ did for you on that cross so long ago. Father, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you. May we never forget and may our lives be a reflection of your love and your mercy and your grace. And may others see you in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, next week we're going to continue looking at this parable. We're going to consider the older brother's role in the whole thing. It's not as fun as it might sound. In fact, it's one of my least favorite portions to preach on, but it's okay. So in the meantime, we pray you have an amazing week. We pray that you'll, God will be preparing all of us to continue learning about the Father's love and our response to that love. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today at M4C.